uh, it, it is recorded. I, I'll lose my job, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's about 9.50. Some folks are getting coffee, but I, I want to go ahead and uh, see if we can go ahead and get started. I'm very pleased that how many of our folks are um, have zoomed in for the class as well. And it may be for those of you who are zoomed in, if you would go ahead and um, if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll see whether or not we can go ahead and do that. I want to say a word uh, of thanks for my Thursday morning women's Bible study. And in particular, Dana Brooks, when this article came out last December in the Christian Century about the NRSVU, she brought a number of questions uh, to the class about it. I had been hearing off and on some uh, conversation about the new NRSVU, the uh, new updated translation. The article in the Christian Century was called An Even Better Bible. And uh, as we talked about it, there was uh, some interest in learning more about the process of translation. I had mentioned that when I was at Princeton Seminary, I was uh, so blessed to have Bruce Metzger as uh, one of my professors. And Bruce had been the chair of the RSV committee back in the 50s. And the hate mail that that dear beloved man got for, you know, disrupting the King James Bible was just awful. And then uh, while I was still there, they were working on the NRSV and that came out. One of the questions that I, I, I sent to John is, I've been a pastor for 37 years and those of you who are in my classes know what my uh, two NRSV study Bibles look like with all the marginal notes. And uh, why would I now get a new Bible without any of my marginal notes in it. I, I mean, I'm more connected to those than I am, I think, to the Textus Receptus, the real Bible, but nevertheless. Um, so I, I talked with Jim um, Boimler about how I might get somebody to speak on this topic, and he encouraged me to reach out to John directly. Um, so I've had a chance to have a Zoom meeting with John about this class, he, at the time of the article, was uh, with the SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature, but was moving uh, to a new position with ALTA, which is not the uh, Atlanta Lawn Tennis Association, as some might uh, think, but the Association uh, for Theological Libraries. And, um, and John was gracious enough to say he would Zoom a meeting for us. I sent him the questions that a number of folks had had asked, and I think, John, maybe we just turn it over to you and start, and we'll go from there. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Well, thanks, Guy. Uh, this is real, a uh, real pleasure, and Nashville is my second home. In fact, we'll be moving back there uh, in November since uh, ATLA is all distributed. The 45 folks that I, I oversee um, the organization um, are in 14 states, and I can work anywhere, and I, I can run the organization from Nashville. Um, and that's where our kids are. So looking forward to getting back there. So yeah, I, I wanted to start with uh, with Guy's questions once he sent. Um, um, and then I do want to get to a point where I ask you some questions about some really challenging words that we had to translate. And I'm going to ask you, how would you have done it? Um, uh, and then I'll open it up for questions. But those three words, uh, and you can, yeah, I'm sure you'll be able to get a sense of how challenging they were. Uh, were the word for slave in Hebrew and Greek, uh, the word for the Jews, eudios, in, uh, in the New Testament, and sodomy um, in uh, Corinthians and 1 Timothy. So let me start with um, one of the questions was, I'd like to know where the impetus for the update comes, or is this part of a periodic prog uh, progress? Um, so the idea of an update started around 2013, um, when the National Council of Churches, which owns the rights to the NRSV, um, and the RSV, uh, approached SBL about the NRSV's future. Um, and SBL had a stake in the game. From the beginning, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, uh, it's the version that remains the primary translation uh, in English-speaking classrooms and has historically been uh, the text for mainline churches and in, in theological education. 
uh, our, our members teach from it. Um, and uh, we also have been, um, SBL was um, very active in public um, uh, um, engagement uh, on the Bible uh, and in congregations. So we felt we had, you know, a, a dog in the race. Um, the, um, the, the question that, the reason we, we approached, we wanted to take this on was that, um, was that there's been a lot of change uh, since 1989 when the NRSV was published, especially in three areas. Uh, one is the discovery of new texts in the Bible, uh, texts of the Bible, uh, manuscripts and evidence, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, new principles that scholars use to reconstruct ancient texts. And then the last were new insights on the meaning of some ancient words in their historical context over the last 30 years. From the beginning, we emphasized that we didn't know the extent to which the review would produce changes, um, how many, uh, we, we just didn't know. Um, so the original proposal emphasized that the significance of the project rested in the review process itself, not the number of suggested changes. So we called it a, basically a 30 year review, what, what should you might say become regular scheduled maintenance um, on this text that stretches back to 1611. Um, I, um, I do think that there will be ongoing periodic reviews after this 30 year review that we, we started. Um, uh, and in fact, we already put together, we plan to put together a panel in five years to review issues and questions that the public and scholars raise about the choices uh, we made. So that's the first question. The second was, is the update truer to the original languages or more related to today, today's language and culture? Um, that's a great question. Uh, remember, we, we took this on in the course over uh, a, a four years. So we, the, the SBL proposed a limited review and focused on scholarship, not style. Um, so our focus was to improve two specific areas. Uh, first, it was a review of new textual evidence for the Bible. And second, new insights in philology. I'm going to come back to those two words. Um, in addition, we did ask the editors to improve style, but only rarely parsimoniously, we, we used the expression, when the, the English was really awkward or it was unclear or inaccurate. Um, the, um, in the process, we also improved the completeness and the consistency of textual notes in the translation at the, at the footnotes. There are a lot more notes, and I also want to come back to that. We also changed the versification of some sections, so verse numbers conform to both early practice um, and current liturgical practice, including in the Orthodox tradition. I think that's a huge boost to this translation that can be used by Catholic, Protestants, Jews, uh, Orthodox. And then along the way, we, we developed approaches to words that were philologically inaccurate and culturally insensitive, like leprosy or sodomy or certain words for disabilities. Um, and so even with that limited mandate, we really basically followed the King James Version uh, principle that is in the 1611 preface. And it, it was, we never thought from the beginning that we would need to make a new translation, but to make a good one better. So that was the role was that we felt the burden of transmitting uh, the 1611 to the authorized version, to the RSV, to the NRSV, and then to this updated edition. So let me unpack a couple terms because I think they're really important. I think this is interesting. Um, first is text criticism. The role of textual criticism in, in Bible translation is to establish a base text from which to translate a text that re, that's reconstructed from the earliest versions and fragments. For many ancient texts like Homer, we might have a handful of versions or, of the original. The Bible is completely different because of the explosion of its use by so many groups. For example, the Old Testament, uh, we have versions in the original Hebrew and, Greek and Aramaic, but also translations in Greek and Latin and Syriac, as well as fragments like the Dead Sea Scrolls. For the New Testament, it's crazier. Literally tens of thousands of variants exist in the original Greek, but also other translations. There are more variants of the New Testament than words in the New Testament. So take a deep breath um, because a lot of these different versions uh, can be organized into families and some of them are really clear scribal errors. Still, um, S scholars take all this textual evidence from the earliest versions of biblical manuscripts in a variety of original languages to create a base text, and this is called a critical edition. 
you can buy these. They're, they're in university libraries. A typical critical edition provides a main text, the text at the top of the page, with all the important readings in the foot, uh, alternative readings in the footnotes. Scholars follow these kind of long established rules to, to figure out what's the preferred or superior reading based upon consensus uh, and using these rules, though it's really more art than science sometimes. Sometimes the choice is six and one half dozen. Um, and, uh, and translators then rely on this critical edition of the Bible to translate their into whatever language, English, whatever. All the way back to the King James Version, modern translations use this same printing model, this the same format. Um, in your NRSV, if you look at it, you'll have the same format. You'll have a translation on the top, and that's the preferred reading of, out of all the possible readings. And then the notes have an alternative reading that's very compelling, but isn't the preferred reading. And these are in footnotes at the bottom. So that's text criticism. That's a, a, a critical edition. Philology, which was the second part of the mandate, was is the study of the original meanings of words. Translating words from any language into another language is difficult. Translating words from ancient dead languages is really difficult. Sometimes we don't even know what a word means and a footnote will say meaning uncertain because that word only occurs one time in the whole Bible. The, um, the notes in the translation are very, very important. The ones at the, at the bottom of your, your Bibles and this practice of using them goes all the way back to the King James Version in 1611 King James mandated that no King James Version Bible could be printed without the notes. And the reason was that the, at the scholars wanted the readers to know and understand that parts of the translation are uncertain. And that's what those notes highlight. Um, how we got to from kind of the King James only where the text becomes kind of sacrosanct um, is odd because that was the original purpose and still is the purpose of the notes. So the important takeaway is realizing that there's no original text behind any Bible translation because they start with a reconstruction of a text from thousands of manuscripts. Any questions on that? I'm gonna to jump to um, the question of whether the alternative words, um, um, uh, whether um, uh, alternative words mentioned in the notes, um, whether these are favored for, for the NRSV. Any questions? Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that, John. The question is, if you're working with dead language, uh, what? who knows what the right, right words are? So we there's all kinds of cognate languages that we have more evidence of a word than in the language we're translating, and we use that to help us understand. Um, you, you take, um, sometimes there's... Uh, um, uh, uh, um, manuscripts that have uh, a language that we know fairly well, like Latin or Greek, set, set alongside the Hebrew, that helps us too. But you're always kind of deciphering and putting it together from the evidence um, that, we, that we have. Um, but the cognate languages help quite a bit. Let me jump to the next one. Um, so I was saying that, again, I'm, I may be I think it's really important to emphasize that the notes tell you a lot. They tell you that uh, that the meaning of the original text is uncertain sometimes, that you need other things to help you understand what the Bible says. We added a lot more notes um, in the, the updated edition than were in the NRSV, but still the alternative meaning is secondary. So it, it isn't the preferred reading. It's, it may be a close second and maybe in the future, uh, and this happens quite a bit where the alternative reading um, uh, well, the, in the future, a translator will, will conclude that the alternative reading is better. Um, and there's lots of cases in the past where these have been swapped out. The alternative reading became the, the translated word and the translated word um, was relegated to the footnote. Every book went through uh, this text critical review um, before we started um, the translation in order to evaluate whether to modify the, the textual basis. And you can read about how we establish that text, that base text in the preface to the uh, new NRSV. So the next question is a great one. For, is the, uh, uh, guy alluded to it. He says, I'm 63. I've been teaching out of my two NRSV study Bibles for 20 years. I have copious marginal notes. Why do I need to get a new Bible? 
So let me say first that uh, because we, what's, so uh, we, the NRSV UE, and actually, frankly, the NRSV is not the most poetic translation. It's, and we didn't revise it for, to reflect the most contemporary um, English. Um, some editors certainly sent in books they heavily edited for style, um, but that would have made the entire Bible inconsistent. Uh, so we rejected most of those major changes for style. If it didn't, um, dramatically improve the, uh, the meaning of the text. It also, um, the NRSV still is at a relatively high reading level. It's not something the mandate sought to address, let alone could do in three years. And the NRSV, I think the real value proposition is NRSV UE belongs to this long family of iterations back to the King James Version, actually back to Tyndale uh, into the 16th century. So that, that feature is a virtue, an English version stretching back to the 16th century with new additions that constantly improve based upon scholarship what came before. In other words, we didn't start from scratch. That is a virtue, something to support. I also mentioned um, from the stuff that we thought the primary value would be in the review process itself, regardless of the extent of the, the uh, revisions we adopted. We didn't know, however, that we'd have 12,000 substantive changes and 20,000 total changes. That is a lot. And every one was deemed absolutely necessary based upon essentially those two primary mandates, the meaning of the words and the basis, the, what we can reconstruct as the original text. Um, some books have more. For example, there are generally more changes in the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament um, based on the Dead, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, there's even more changes in the Apocrypha. Um, for example, the Book of Tobit in the NRSV translated from a short Greek manuscript. Um, the NRSV UE, we decided that it should be translated from the longer Greek. So you'll see a major change in that book. Still, uh, maybe to Guy's point, will it radically change your theology? No. Um, should you support efforts to make translations as accurate as possible? Yes. Um, and I do think that is a compelling reason for the mainline churches that care about scholarship to, to recognize that if this, doesn't, if this doesn't have some commercial value, the, the NCC won't be able to do this again. Um, so you're kind of part of that tradition stretching back to the King James Version and purchasing um, this iteration that tries to make the Bible more and more accurate. And so I want to kind of highlight Three, three of these value propositions. One is, it is now the most current academically vetted translation. Second, it's, it's the main text used in higher ed and theological education for teaching in English, uh, English context. I think there's something to celebrate um, and support because, because frankly of the growing skepticism of the public towards scholarship. Um, and I, and this, this is you know not just happening in culture, but it's happening in the church. And the last is that, um, this is the most ecumenical and interfaith translation, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Jewish. Uh, and I think in a period of really divisiveness, that's, that's also a virtue to be celebrated. But there are two more values. Um, so Guy, your, your personal notes, I'm gonna suggest, um, may sometimes hinder rather than help. In other words, familiarity with a text sometimes stands in a way of new insights. You, uh, you read your notes as your interpretation, and then you move on and may not consider something new with fresh eyes. Second, I often tell seminary students that they should learn Greek and Hebrew. Not, not because after one year of each, you're gonna have great insights into the Bible or what the word means. Instead, I know this sounds simplistic, but if you have to translate a text, in your first year of Greek or Hebrew, Old Testament or New Testament, it forces you to read slowly. That's it, that, it's just that simple. Um, and slowing down is how insight comes, even if you're reading in your own language. You start again with new Bible, it's now more accurate, and you'll be forced to read more slowly, looking more closely, looking for things that are different. How does that strike you, Guy, as a, as a reason to buy this? Now that I've been chasing, John, 
Um, you're not wrong. I did a funeral yesterday for Jim Nash, a 88 year old retired Presbyterian minister. And one of the texts he wanted read at his service was, um, let me see if I have this right. Psalm 117, 16, I think it was. And it was a translation out of the CEB, the uh, Contemporary English Bible. And um, he loved that translation because it spoke about God's righteousness being passed on to his grandchildren. And it was a very fresh reading. Um, the folks here know that uh, I'm I'm big on, on, uh, on slowing down and reading. I, I've often been amazed at friends who have facilities in other foreign languages who have chosen to do their devotions out of a French Bible or a German Bible as a way to keep on their language, but also forcing them to sort of live with that text in a deeper way. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to go out and, and get a, a new Bible. I, I, I was thinking, though, John, when you were talking about um, the lot more footnotes, uh, a number of years ago, I bought Robert Alter's new three volume. Um, and my Lord, it's like, you know, reading Bart in that you've got the text and then you actually have more in the footnotes than you do in the text. And uh, it was a really rich, I was teaching, I think, uh, in that same year, um, two different disciple classes. And one, we were looking at the prophets, and the other one, we were looking at the writings um, and spending time, you know, deeply going through that, you know, took half of my week. But nevertheless, it was a good journey. Uh, so I, I, I'm not a opposed to it per se, but uh, I do like my marginal notes, John. I must say they are, you know, when I shuffle off this mortal coil, no doubt they will go into some, you know, honored place that everyone can, you know, learn of my, uh, my knowledge over these years. But thank you for that uh, chastening. I appreciate that. That was, that was a good word. Yeah. You know, the, the, the other thing about the languages. I was uh, so blessed uh, when I was at Princeton to have uh, a good friendship with Ed Dowie. Hmm. And Ed was our uh, professor of, of really Reformed theology and Reformed history. Uh, he was the, the kind of driving voice behind the Confession of 67, uh, Ed was, which they did about a week before there was any sensitivity toward masculine language, right? You can't swing a dead cat and not hit a masculine pronoun, right? So, uh, but Ed used to say that one of the big differences when he went through Princeton in the 40s, and when, when we went through in the 80s, you could hear in the semantic shift of the question, they would ask him, do you have Greek? Meaning, do you know it? Can you use it? They would ask us, have you done Greek? Meaning, have you fulfilled your responsibility and checked that off and moved off to something else? There were maybe four or five, maybe a few more uh, of my classmates out of a class of maybe about 120 who came to seminary with a, a, a well-used Greek Nestle's New Testament, that they had Greek. The rest of us had to catch up on the biblical languages. Hmm. Donovan doesn't talk about this much, but his father was a Greek scholar, should have been a Greek teacher. And so he and his dad would be on the phone with one another talking about the text that Donovan was getting ready to preach the next week. Donovan has Greek. I've done Greek, right? Um, oh. uh, we, we had uh, here, I don't know if I told you, John, but Leong Xiao taught for us uh, for five weeks on the second half of Job. Uh, we we're so fortunate to have him here. And I had... Uh, I had him for Hebrew, and I, I probably got a little further along with him than I did with Blessed Cullen I.K. story uh, at Princeton. But uh, it's, it's um, you know, one of the things you might want to talk about, you mentioned um, uh, criticism, and, and maybe just give a little overview of text criticism, of literary criticism, historical criticism, all of those kinds of things. 
that uh, folks may not be quite as familiar with? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great. I mean, that that is backing up into kind of the meat and potatoes. Um, um, I, I think in some ways the issue of philology and the issue of text criticism. I'll come back to trying to um, decipher the meaning of very complex words um, in languages we we don't have easy access to um, that are limited in the, in the corpus, the number of texts. Um, and uh, have to be reconstructed. Um, and if we have time, I, I want to talk about how that reconstruction actually is really artificial. Um, but there's also a virtue in it. So if we have time, I do want to come back to that. The issue of philology um, in terms of historical criticism comes up, you mentioned the issue of gender. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, um, I, one of the distinctions, I would say, that the RSV and the NRSV have had is that um, they've come into the, the, that the RSV when it was published was actually condemned by Joseph McCarthy as un-American. That's a distinction, not, not a, um, I, I don't think he recognized what he was doing there. Uh, that was terrific when he, he, uh, he said that. Um, and it was over um, trend, words that, um, you know, as I mentioned in that Christian century, you change anything and it makes people anxious. Um, but the irony is that the notes have always been there. We're always signaling how complex this is, the historical critical way of reconstructing the ancient world. And when it came to gender, that caused so much consternation with the RS NRSV, all they were, all Metzger and company were doing was applying the principle of historical criticism. When you see the word mankind, you know what it means, right? Men and women. Um, and that's what they were trying to find the context one that was a masculine pronoun. Did it mean men and women? We did the same thing. I wasn't going to use this as an example, but we have the word Adelphois, uh, brothers. It's translated as brothers in the NRSV. Metzger didn't take that, the principle of the gender as far as we did. So when we had Adel Adelphoi, um, we translated as brothers and sisters. Um, because that's what it means in that context uh, when Paul is speaking to a, you know, a church. Um, so we, you'll see in the, in the NRSV that we applied Metzger's principle, but that's an historical critical approach. That's what the meaning, the word meant in that case. We do that all the time too um, in, in English. Uh, we don't recognize it. Um, ironically, when we did it, when Metzger and we do it with the Bible, um, everyone's up in arms, but that's the historical meaning. Uh, in its context, it's the same word, which I'm going to come back to, um, want to actually touch on that now, so, uh, because one of the questions was, what are the winners and losers? Um, what's gained in the translation? And I don't think there were, there. I think there are only gains, but I have a philosophical concern about translation itself, even though I directed it. This is a philosophical concern about translation, especially having grown up Catholic. Saying that a translation is more accurate may communicate wrongly that you only need a translation, that the meaning is clear, uh, you know, sola scriptura. But the, trend, but the Bible is not a book. It's a series of books, and they're written over hundreds of years in different time periods by different people using words whose meanings change over time. Every translation makes choices, which I want to get to some of these examples uh, of the challenging choices we had to make. But in general, here are a few big ones. First, the whole enterprise depends on establishing this one base uh, text on thousands of manuscripts. That's kind of artificial. But because we know uh, that there were different Jewish communities using different versions of the text for their tradition at the same time, and different Christian communities using different texts for their faith. In other words, legitimately different Bibles being used by different communities of faith in the Christian or Jewish tradition at the same time. So maybe the original text is not the best one to try to reconstruct, if there ever was one. So second, we tend to harmonize words, um, the meaning of words. We, translations try to render the same word consistently. For example, let's take pistis, faith. Um, we try to translate that um, the same in different contexts, but words uh, might mean something different at different times, have different connotations, different contexts. 
this sometimes gets lost literally in translation. We, we might, we might translate a word in Genesis the same way we do in Jeremiah, but should we? Um, so just check, you know, the uh, Oxford English Dictionary for how many how English changes over the last century. Or closer to the topic, there's a really wonderful article on how some words in the King James Version mean something completely different um, now than they did in 1611. But today's readers may read the modern meaning into that 400-year-old word, totally getting misunderstanding what the King James Version translation meant. Here's the biggest issue, though, the biggest choice that translations make. And this one, I'll pose it as, as four questions. First is, and this goes back to Guy's question of historical critical, historical criticism, uh, textual criticism, literary criticism, criticism re reconstructing a text. What, so the first question is, what are the original author's social and cultural assumptions in that period and place and time? Second question is, what are our assumptions, both the translators and the readers? Third question is, whose do we translate? Our assumptions or the text's assumptions? And last, can you do both in a single translation or do you have to choose? What do you think? All right, my biblical scholars, what do you think? Notes, Lisa says notes, got to do notes. Thoughts? Well, let me give you some examples. Ch Chuck said uh, he thought you look to the community of believers who's going to use the text. So you would argue that in some ways, the modern uh, interpretation is the one that one needs. But then again, I think it would be fair to suggest, as John did, just as there were ancient churches that were using different issues, which of the modern perspectives would you use, right? Because we certainly have a plurality of positions on you know, doctrine and dogma and, and even words. So uh, I'm sorry, John, go ahead and- uh, No, that's that, that is, I actually, that's an area that I write on quite a bit that, um, that both in the ancient world and in the modern world and embedded in the Bible itself is compromise. And that communities, religious communities, Jewish and Christian in the ancient world um, made um, decisions to incorporate contradictory texts because they represented parts of a community in which it was more important to stay together and compromise than it was to impose distinct differences so that the Bible isn't homogenous. The early communities weren't homogenous, nor are we now. Um, so Guy's point is really important, um, something I'd, I'd love to talk more about uh, in another context. So the, so the point being is that the translation of words even if they're true to the context the genre do and sometimes strike the modern reader as unsettling, right? Um, um, should we take out of the Bible some harsh expressions? There's a lot of misogyny, homophobia, xenophobia, um, ones that contradict science. Um, everyone on the, the, uh, the update team felt the challenge of rendering words whose connotations in the reader's ears can't be controlled. Um, and that's a burden on translators. Um, ironically, as I can say as a, as a Catholic, Bible translation, which is uniquely Reformation driven, highlights the limitations of sola scriptura. The American Bible Society used to, used to have this expression, they no longer use it, that you read the Bible with, quote, without note or comment. You know, can it be? Should it be? So all of us on the on the team wish the notes could have been doubled, tripled, that no one should read the Bible without commentaries or dictionaries. Um, and the expectation that a translation, even with notes that are by practicality limited, um, the, the reference to Alter's um, three volume, um, that was still limited and publishers, you know, no, no Bible publisher wants to, you know, double the size of the Bible with notes. So with them, the expectation is that um, that 
um, you simply don't want to represent the Bible in an almost inerrant fashion um, because it's not something uh, any translation can do. So that that's a, might be a good segue to um, um, the guy said the question, they said, what are you disappointed about with the translation? Um, are there specific words, uh, for example, the Jews that are that were a special challenge for the committee? Uh, yes, there were there were uh, challenging words. Um, I mentioned a couple, including words for disability, disabilities. Um, there, there is a word that I think we created a chink in the army armor on trustworthiness because of how uh, conservative communities would um, assume we had an agenda, which we we didn't. We tried not to, but there are a number of words and concept concepts that were really challenging, um, and. Um, uh, because we are trying to simultaneously be contemporary in style, sensitive to misperception, possible misuse of the text, and historically, um, and, and to be historically accurate. So I'll, I'll, uh, I think we have time. I'll, I'll give you three examples, um, and I'll ask you um, what, what you would have done. So slavery, um, the, the word slave, uh, Obviously, slavery in the ancient world was was a given. Um, it could even be divinely sanctioned. Prisoners of war, for example, were uh, you know God said take the prisoners of war and make them prison and make them slaves. Also, the word slave, the word slave, just that expression in, in English gives the impression that it's an ontological category or condition, namely one is a slave by nature, um, as if it's an objective state or condition. Um, taking out of the fact that actually someone made you a slave, you were made a slave, you weren't, you weren't a slave by nature. So we struggled with two things. First, how to translate the word to express agency, that is, that someone made someone a slave. Um, and it's a, that's an important distinction um, that especially the African American community was very sensitive to. Um, but translating slave as enslaved one, which we did on occasion can be awkward. So we did it where we could when it wasn't bad style, but we were limited in an English translation not to make um, it really awkward um, in certain, particularly New Testament texts that list categories of people, husband, wife, slave, servant, things like that. Um, the second concern or issue is that the word slave is used both as a human to human condition, institution, slavery in the ancient world or in the modern world, and for the divine human relationship. In other words, you're a servant of God because the word slave in both Greek and Hebrew, Ebed and doulos, can mean both servant and slave. How do you translate those? And, and also, uh, Paul uses slave for his relationship with Christ all the time. He says, he says I'm a slave of Christ. The African-American community was really divided on this. Some felt that it was the historical context. Um, we had to translate it as slave if it was if it was clearly a slave, not just a servant. Um, and that distinction is pretty fine. Um, but they acknowledged that we, and they acknowledged that we couldn't footnote every time. That would have been impossible. It occurs a lot of times. Others felt that when read anywhere in the Bible, slave or heard from the pulpit or in a vacation Bible school, it implicitly approves of the institution of slave. It's in the Bible, right? Um, and, and remember, the Bible was used to justify slavery uh, for centuries from the pulpit, from the pulpit in the Civil War. So what would you do? Would you eliminate slavery from the Bible? The United States. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you could hear that, John, but a question whether or not you could put marginal notes or footnotes 
uh, about the difference between ancient slavery where you were taken as a prisoner of war versus the institution uh, in the Southern states. Um, and I wondered, if, really before that, I, I'm thinking of A.J. Levine's uh, Jewish New Testament that she put together and the wonderful articles that she had there that would actually be a bit of an essay to explain that. So you didn't have to do that with all the marginalia. But I'm looking at Doug Crookshanks, who uh, took me apart in a uh, disciple Bible study at one point about over slavery in the Bible. Um, and we have studied uh, Howard Thurman's work uh, okay. here as well that uh, deals so powerfully with, uh, as you suggested, his grandmother, who herself had been a slave, wouldn't read Paul because uh, every time they, uh, her owner would bring a preacher in to speak to the slaves, they were always choosing the Pauline text about how the slaves should obey their masters. And so she was like, you know, read Jesus, don't read Paul. Um, so yeah, exactly. So that, um, <clears throat> Uh, so one of the things that SBL had going, Society of Biblical Literature, is when is earlier, uh, a few years ago, we launched a site called Bible Odyssey. One of the things, it, it's, it's a public-facing site funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It, it, it's an amazing resource for the public. It's, may, it's meant for the public. It gets 11,000 to 12,000 visitors a day. It's, it, it's, it's phenomenal, 4 million a year. Um, and we use that site to do exactly what Guy said it, and one of the one of the folks uh, is we used that to explain these challenging words. So as we were doing the translation, we used that as a way, and the and the NCC published those, or we we published them, but they linked to those. We also SBL publishes a study Bible, uh, like uh, just like uh, the Oxford uh, that's part of the New Testament that a Amy Jill um, uh, uh, edited with Mark Brettler. And uh, yes, yeah, study Bibles are the are essential. Um, that's what I mean by you can't rely on a translation that has limited capacity to fit in in someone's pocket or a pew or what have you. But study Bibles are bigger. They tend to be. They tend to have a perspective. You know, they tend to be either us focused on critical scholarship or um, an amplified text. Uh, they could be also very conservative in nature. Um, but the moment you get into commentary or study Bible, you even make more choices because you determine what that interpretation should be for your, for people. Uh, but we, that is, that is what we uh, are engaged in too. SBL will publish that study Bible, which will take some of these challenging words and put them in essays, just the way uh, um, the uh, the New Testament, the Jewish New Testament did. Um, we were we we struggled over this. We we what we made was the distinction that if it was a if it was a human institution, we did translate it as slave, even as unpalatable as that was. You know, slaves. You know, uh, you know, follow your masters. Uh, I think we may have actually put slave owners because that uh, uh, that put a pin in that emphasized that agency a little bit more. But for the divine human relationship. We translated as servant so that when it came to Paul, he was a servant of Christ, not a slave of Christ. That was a decision we had to make because we were trying to be sensitive to the modern misuse or abuse and the historical context. In the interest of time, I want to jump. I, I was going to cover the Eudios, the Jews, uh, but I really recommend, highly recommend uh, Amy Jill Levine's um, com, um, interview in last month's Christian Century. Um, where she talks about, she was the person we consulted along with others, and we followed her advice. We had to keep the Jews in the text in certain contexts, um, whereas others, when it referred to a geographic location, we could translate it as the Judeans. Could be in either one, um, but we we uh, she was uh, one of uh, three people we consulted with. But lastly, just in the interest of time, I wanna I wanna bring up the hardest thing we dealt with: the word sodomy. It was added to the Bible by the NRSV. Bruce Metzger added it to the Bible. Um, it wasn't in the, this translation family. It wasn't in the RSV. The words arsenic koitai is the Greek, and it occurs in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and uh, 1 Timothy 1, 10. The translation, it's translated as sodomy, and it wasn't translated as sodomy before the NRSV. Um, and it's the word, that term sodomy is definitely anachronistic carries modern meanings that are inappropriate. 
for the ancient world. But how should it be translated? Should we remove it? There's no single part of the four-year project as highly charged as discussions of these verses. Um, I mean, it, the emotions ran so high uh, in the room and we were all just trying to find a consensus. Um, in the end, that this was the one decision where I had to finally kind of cut the Gordian knot um, and I'm not sure I did the right thing. So you know the issues, right? Concerns. We often hear someone using the Bible to support racism, sexism, xenophobia. I read a report a few years ago that Nigeria's um, so-called whisper campaign um, to round up gay men used churches and mosques to help. And the BBC reporter, Will Rossi said, everybody quoted the Bible or quoted the Quran to justify this help. So there's consequences to translations. And some on the translation team felt all references to homosexuality had to be removed because of the history of its use and abuse, imprisonment, violence, murder. So while the Greek is something of a Pauline no neologism, he made that word as a as a Pauline word. He made it up of, out of a combination of words. It clearly refers to male homosexual sex. However, in that charged atmosphere where we hoped to do more good than harm, even though our charge was to reflect the historical meaning and hope readers would consult commentaries, study Bibles, theologians, ethicists, pastors, we punted and translated it as men who engage in illicit sex. And then in the footnote, we said meaning of Greek uncertain. It isn't completely true. Um, it is uncertain word um, because it's a Pauline neologism, but the connotation is, is clear enough. Um, and we did leave other verses that condemned homosexual male sex in the Bible where it was crystal clear in the Hebrew or the Greek, that's, a, that's what it meant. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, and Paul in Romans uh, 1, 26, 27. The translation is clear there, so that we translated it clearly. But I asked, what, what would you have done? But before that, here's the kicker. After the translation was released, some scholars in the LGBTQ community in SBL objected to our removing the reference to homosexual sex in these two passages. They felt we were trying to erase them and their presence from the Bible. In fact, uh, one of the expressions was we were gay washing. Those, uh, th this is how they reasoned. Those that are not religious should see the text as homophobic through and through. And those, they also reasoned that are religious should understand how theology and interpretation progress in a modern world over time. We've done that with evolution, astronomy, slavery, sexism. We've, we, know, we know the world is round now, despite the Bible saying it's flat, right? We know the world was created over billions of years, not in seven days. But for lots of communities, the Bible is, is flat. I mean, an interpretation. So my question is, what would you have done in this case on such a highly charged concept that has resulted in imprisonment, violence, and murder? And still does. All right, translators, what would you have done? You would have gone to Bells is what you would have done. This Leslie is doing right now. Bye, Leslie. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, Lisa said, I don't know if you could hear John, you know, thank, thankfully that it wasn't one person, that it's a collaboration. And I do think that one of the things uh, that we need to understand about the NRSVUE, and this is an insight given to me by one of our members, Danielle Pott, uh, 
uh, this new relationship with the Orthodox uh, community, um, that it's a wider group of people at the table than had been even in the RSV or the NRSV, right? And so um, trying to figure that out on top of this 400 plus year tradition from Tyndall through the King James, through the R, I mean, there is this ongoing debate. Uh, I'm remembering a time, it's the only time I preached at my home church. And I uh, crazily uh, had the passage out of 1 Corinthians 6 about not taking each other to, uh, to, to the law courts. And my home church used to preach Lex Continua. And so they said to me, well, we're glad you're here. You can preach whatever you want. But, you know, the next passage is 1 Corinthians 6. And there's this long passage of what you used to be, right? You used to be lawless and fornicators and sodomites and all of this. And, uh, but you're no longer that. You're this. And so I finished preaching. And I, I took it on in part because my dad was a judge back in the, the hometown and was active in the church that way. And I had one kid brother of a guy I graduated with who would not let go that I didn't focus on the sodomite. And that was the only thing he could hear in that text. And I'm like, brother, what about the six or seven other things that are in that if I chose on the negative side? But Paul is clearly, you're not that anymore. You're this. It, um, so anyway, it was, uh, it was crazy. I think the answer, John, is we don't know how we trans. Well, Ken, Ken Handy would. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Could could you hear that, John? I couldn't. No. Uh, so he's suggesting that uh, when we get rid of words that we've been with, it can be a slippery slope. And would we also get rid of the the flat Earth seven day? Uh, understanding and how do we, you know, translate that? My guess is that that's um, very much interpreted in the marginal notes and uh, and the essays. But your point's well taken. Yeah. So if I could say one last thing about that, because I think that's a brilliant observation. I think the role of the mainline and progressive um, traditions is to be able to say that's in the Bible, but we don't. It's not true. Um, and that the ability to do that, to step back and admit that, um, is what I think the church is about. It's it's a, it's progress um, taking in science and social science and ethics into the equation and using the historical critical context to understand um, how we're different and and how um, we're we're supposed to. Um, um, reinterpret a text for the modern world. John, I think we're uh, close to up at time. I'm exceedingly encouraged with your note to me that you will be moving to Nashville and know that you will have an opportunity to teach at Westminster when you come here. Uh, I, I look forward to our meeting in person and thank you so much for your time with us. This has been great. Jim, Hudna Boimler is in class, so you can uh, wave at him and he'll wave back. Um, thank you all for coming, both in class and also in Zoom. This has been a wonderful, uh, rich conversation, and I'm grateful, frankly, to be part of a tradition that takes seriously um, our continual work with the text. Um, and and I, I hadn't known, I think, John, that you were Roman Catholic. Whenever I go to the Holy Land, I think my favorite place is when I go to the church in the nativity and I go downstairs where the Vulgate was translated by Jerome. You know, you can quibble about whether or not 
this is the exact site where Jesus was born, or this is the exact site where the crucifixion happened. But you cannot argue that that was not the place that the Bible was translated into the Vulgate. And when I got there, it was just astounding to me. Yeah, yeah just huge. Grace and peace, friend. Thank you so much Thanks. for being with us. Thank you, everyone. This has really been rich. Take care.